Okay, in this video, we're going to go over lines 50 through 75. Remember at this point, we have had Juno talking about how she is very upset and feels indignant that she has been unable to thwart Aeneas in success of his mission. And remember that she wants to do this because she can see hundreds of years later, the fruits of his efforts will end up being the city of Rome, the Roman Empire, and they will destroy Carthage. She particularly has been incensed by the fact that Pallas Minerva was successful in getting vengeance on a returning person from the Trojan War, and yet Juno has been thwarted at this time. So, we begin in line 50. Our subject here is the Dea, that is first clinching, and she is modified by a present active participle. So, the goddess, Volutans, rolling, as it were, Voluto Volutare, and then Talia is our accusative. Now, Talia comes from the third clinching adjective, Talis, Talis, Tale, which means such, or the sort of. It is basically the word that answers the question qualis. Qualis asks what sort of? Talis, such sort of. And if we go over here and look at the declension chart, you can see here Talis, Talis, Tale, and Talia is going to be nominative accusative, or should nominative plural or accusative plural, and it's accusative plural as we see it here. So the goddess, rolling such things, and in English, we usually think to ourselves, but in Latin you think with yourself. So rolling uh, such things with herself in her heart. Cor cordis. It's where we get the word cordial, which means to speak from the heart. And it's the one having been inflamed in her inflamed heart. She comes, and I know that it is present instead of perfect because that E is short. If I had made that E long, it would have become then at that point a perfect tense verb. She comes into the fatherland, the word patria, first declension, is cognate with pater, but it means fatherland, country, of the clouds. And then we just merely, as an appositive, rename who or what that fatherland is, Iolia. And another appositive, a location, a place, pregnant is what feta means, it's modifying loca, and pregnant, forentibus austris, ablative by with, because of, from in on at, with, the raging present active participle, you can tell because of the NT, Alster winds. When we meet the winds, which are obviously going to be the entities that wreck Aeneas' ship, they are all personified and they have names. Alster is the southern wind, which is of course why it's called Australia, or Austria, south of Germany. Notus is where we get the word north, the north wind, Eurus, east, the east wind, and of course, Zephyrus, and there are others as well, like the south, I think it's west wind, is Africus, because that is the direction from which it came to the Romans themselves. So, the fatherland, Iolia, a place teeming, pregnant, with the raging austere winds. Here, remember Long I is here, the King Iolus. And here we have our first example of a Virgilian word picture. In that, antro comes from the word antrum, antri, which is one of the words in Latin that means cave. Another one would be spelunka, which is where we get the word spelunking. And it is modified by wasto, which we can bird word. That just mainly means vast or huge. So King Iolus in a vast cave. And what you can see is that literally King Iolus in between wasto antro is within the words in a vast cave. And so he is intentionally created it like this to be what is known as a word pitcher. And so here, King Iolus, and we find out what he then does. He, the nominative subject, premit and frenat. Premit, which comes from premo premere, pressi pressus, means to press, and frenat, freno frenare, means to restrain, literally to bridle. And that's what these winds are going to be somewhat compared to, like horses, wild horses, to be tamed, to be bridled, to be broken. So he presses, and then we have two direct objects, and it creates a chiasmus. Luctantes is an adjective modifying wentos, and sonoras is an adjective modifying tempestas. And what does he press? He presses the winds, restrains them, and they are the luctantes, a present active participle, you focus the NT, the wrestling winds, and the loud, the English word sonorous comes from this, making lots of noise storms, and it's where we get the word tempests, and he presses them with imperio, with power, with authority. 
And it is then, of course, the same word when we get the word imperial or empire, because the empire is the power of the entity. So not only does he press those winds and storms, but he also frena, he bridles them, he restrains them, ablative, with chains, winkla winkli, and with or in a prison, carcare, carcaris. That's where we get the word incarcerate. The Ili then is going to refer to those winds. Those guys being indignant, indignantes, this word literally means to feel unworthy. So those guys, indignant, they, and the word that is the verb is fremo, fremere. It means to bellow, or it's like if you were describing a cow, the mooing of a cow. Or, since they're going to be compared to horses, whinny could even be what they do. So they whinny, and they do so circum claustra, around the enclosures. It's where we get the word claustrophobia, and it recently comes from cloudo, cloudere, clousy clouses. They bellow around the enclosures of the genitive mountain, magno cum mumere, and a good alliteration, and also onomatopoeia. It's onomatopoeic murmur, with a great murmur, as it were. And so these winds are a little bit out of control, or at least champing at the bit to be out of control, but remember, that's the reason as to why he has to restrain them with his power that has been granted to him by Jupiter and obviously why he keeps them somewhat locked up. So we continue on. And... Uh, there we go. Our subject again, Aeolus. He is the king of those winds and why, of course, the name of the location is Aeolia. So Aeolia sits, and again, it's a word picture by Virgil. It is describing where he's doing that sitting on the lofty citadel. A word about both of these two words. Arche comes from arx, arcus, and like I said, that is a citadel. A citadel is usually the high point of a city and the point from which the city can be defended. And very often, by metonymy, which remember is where one word represents something else, or particularly synecdoche, which is a type of metonymy, in which a part of something represents the whole. Somebody has a new car, they drive up, I say, nice wheels! I don't mean the wheels. The wheels represent the whole car. It's called synecdoche. And thus the citadel represents the city itself. The word Kelsa, on the other hand, comes from Kelsus, Kelsa, Kelsum, and with the prefix X on it, we see it in that song, Gloria in Excelsis Deo. If you would sing it in church, Gloria in excelsis Deo. And I bring that up because it is a common mistranslation. Usually it's Gloria to God in the native case, and it's translated into English in the highest. But it's not in Latin, because highest would be superlative, and thus it would be in excelsissimis. It should just be glory to God in the high. But here we translate it as higher lofty. And so it's the lofty citadel where, by with because of from in, illicit. So he, the tenanes, one, teneo tenere, holding the scepters. Remember, that is the staff of authority that comes to symbolize for a king. Que et. And, que, he mollifies. The word mollify is an English word which means to soften. And that's what this word means, to soften. And it's why we call the animals mollusks, because they have soft bodies. And he softens their minds, and he tempers, he, he, he modulates their angers. Ni fakiat. Now, ni is merely a shortened form of nisi. And as such, whenever you see nisi or si, you have the beginnings of a conditional statement. By that, I mean, in English, the statement of if, blah, 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 then, blah, 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 blah. Now, in English and in Latin, the word then can be left off. If it rains, the ground becomes wet. I don't have to say then. I just imply it. And so, when we look at this knee, and if you have a present subjunctive, how do I know I have a present subjunctive? I, A. We fear a giant liar. In the if clause, you will translate the verb with the English word should, and in the then clause, you're going to translate it with the English word would. It is what we call a 
future less vivid conditional. But you don't need to know the terminology as of yet. Just know that when you see a present subjunctive in a conditional, and you know you will have one because of Nissian C, if and then, if he should, and Nissi of course means if not, if he should not do this, as in restrain the winds in the way that we've just seen, then obviously, what Quipe means, the rapidi ones, the rapid ones, referring to the winds themselves. And here, Pharaoh, Fere, Tulilatis. It's irregular, but remember, it wants to be third conjugation. And when you have an A in a third conjugation, it's subjunctive present as well. We fear A, giant liar. Obviously, the rapid ones would bring the accusative direct object, Maria, the seas, and the lands, and Kwe, the boundless sky. The word profound, like if you make a profound statement, it's deep. So again, just like altus can mean high or deep, so does the word profundus it can mean in the depths or in the high, boundless, sky high. And here it's referring to the sky, so boundless sky. They would bring all of those things with them, creating a ruckus. Think about in terms of a tornado. You should be able to see it. Air is clear. It is transparent. So how can you see a tornado? It's all the junk that the tornado twirls up into it and brings with it. You see the dirt and the dust and all that sort of stuff. And, and again, a subjunctive. So it's, if he should not do it, the rapid ones would bring and they would sweep through the breezes. Now, earlier we saw the word ara, arai, which was an altar. You also have aura, aurai, which is a breeze. And so that's what you have as the word here. Do not confuse them, although they do look somewhat similar. Said, but. So we have what would happen if those winds would have gotten loose. But the omnipotent father. And that word, abdo, abdere, abdidi, means to hide away. Kind of like kondo, kondere means to establish or to affix. It's similar in that way. But the omnipotent father, and this is of course referring to Jupiter, he hid them away, he, he buried them. Spelunkis, our other word for cave, in caves, by, with, because of, from, in, on, at. And it's modified by the word atris, which comes from ater, atra, atrum, which means dark or black. And obviously, that's what caves are. I don't know if you've ever been in a cave before. I highly recommend, it's not too far away, it's only about three hours, going to Tennessee to what is called the Lost Sea. And it is the largest underground lake in all of the United States and the second largest in the entirety of the world. And inevitably, whenever you tour a cave, which you can do there, they will turn off the lights and let you see the true darkness that is in a cave without any light source. And one of the interesting things that I had learned when I had gone a couple of years back with my children, I went also in my childhood, but you, if you were ever in complete pitch black and darkness, you would go blind in a couple of weeks because your eyes constantly would strain themselves searching for a light source. And so you would be caused to go blind in that way, apparently. So wild times. But it's why they are dark or black caves. He, the omnipotent father, and our verb from which this present active participle comes, metuo meture, means to fear. He fearing this and the this is the junk that the winds would do. And he imposuit pana panare posui, which means to put it in a place. He placed it, 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 it on, implied them, a mass and mountains, but they are modified by altos, high mountains in super on top. So he essentially buries them in this cave, puts a plug of mass of dirt and mountains on top, and it prevents the winds from getting away and reaping havoc. But not only did he place them in a particular location, he did that, que, not only did he put that stuff on them, que, and do dari de he gave to them, implied, a king. A king who, and then you have your verbs, skire. Now, that is imperfect subjunctive, you can tell because it is an infinitive plus an ending. And so let's use a subjunctive word. Who would know? And the reason why it is subjunctive is that this is a relative clause. Now a relative clause, quick quote, quiz, 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 
quick, 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 quim, clam, quod, a relative clause functions in many ways as an adjectival clause, in that it will describe the antecedent in some particular way. I see Mr. Adams, who teaches Latin at Eastside. That who teaches Latin at Eastside describes Mr. Adams. It's the, the who teaches at Eastside, Mr. Adams. But when you have a subjunctive verb, then we are not necessarily specifically referring to the antecedent as the specific one, but more so, this clause is giving us a characteristic of the antecedent. Who gave the kind of king who would know both and. Both to press them, and here we have foidere kerto. Kerto means certain, unerring, and foidere comes from foidus, foideris. It means a pact, or a treaty, or an agreement, who in a certain agreement, the way that it is drawn up this contract, both would know to press them and who, having been ordered, perfect passive participle, would know, implied how, to give loose reins. Uh, you know that word from Eke Romani in the trip that the corn aliens took, and laxos is just merely laxus um, that means loose. It's where you use the word laxative or relax. Ad quim, to whom, and this is a linking qui in which you could easily replace that quim with a form of is a id, which would make it a um, or hip hack book, and you could say to him. But to whom then, Juno, as a suppliant, one who begs, usa est. Now, a word about the usa est, and I need to take the time to write these down because they are important to know them. There are five deponent verbs in Latin, and I'm going to write them all here, who take objects in the ablative case. Normally, Latin verbs would require their objects to be accusative, but not these. And those words include utor, uti, usus sum, fruor, frui, fructus sum, wayscore, wayski, wesquitus sum, and I'll tell you what they mean in just a moment, if I can remember them all. You have fungor, fungi, functus, sum, and the only one that is not third conjugation. You can see third, 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 and that second principal part. You have potior, potiri, potitus sum. And what they mean is this one is to use. And if you use something badly, you can put an ob in front of it. And so you would have ab utor, ab uti, abuse. So to use, we can see it directly comes from it. This word means to enjoy. It's what we do with fruits, the fructi. Whiskey to some means to feed upon or eat. Fungor means to perform. That's where we get the word function, obviously. And this one means to control or have power over. And remember, all of these take ablative objects. And that's exactly what we see here. She, Juno, the goddess, used, did use, and again, looks passive. It's perfect, but translates actively, these ablative voices. Usually, you translate ablatives by, with, because of, from, in, on, at. But when they are functioning as the object of a verb, you don't use those special English translations. Same thing when a dative is an object of a special verb. You don't use two or four. So she used these words. In the vocative, addresses him. Aeolus. For the father of the gods. Remember, this should be the war room, but we've seen this many times before, and we will see it many times after, that you have a syncopation, and the OR drops out for genitive plural. For the father of the gods, Atque, and the king of men have given it or have granted it, dodari didatis, to you, et, et, both to soothe, and that's what mulke o mulcare means, the waves, a fourth declension, and if you were to look over here in the fourth declension, you can see long us, could be genitive, could be nominative plural, could be accusative plural, fluctus is in the accusative plural, and it's where we get the word fluctuate as a wave. Wait, can you do that if you want to do that? I, I, I forgot the pan. That's perfectly fine. Fourth declension, genitive singular, us, nominative plural, us with a long u, and what we have fluctus on the board in this line is the accusative plural. So, 
He, that Father of the gods and the King of men, has granted it to you both, et, et, to soothe the waves and tolo, tolere sestili sublatus, means to lift up. And it's going to also take as a direct object the waves, ablative with the wind. Now, students very often make the mistake of saying to soothe the waves and to lift the wind. It is not to lift the wind. You have to have a direct object in the accusative. To lift what? To lift the waves, and that's the ablative with the wind. She continues and says, A gains, uh, talking directly, remember, to Aeolus. A race hostile. If amicus, aum, means friendly, then inimicus is the opposite, or unfriendly. And a race hostile, unfriendly, to me, sails the Tyrrhenian Sea. Remember that the Tyrrhenian Sea is the sea that is boarded, or bordered, by Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, and that's where these guys are setting sail from Sicily, about to make their way, and she then, of course, is wanting the god Aeolus, the king of the winds, to intervene. I'll stop the camera. When I, no, 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 when I edit it. Do y'all need something? Oh, no. I'm oh, okay. You're just standing? Yeah. Okay. A rice, a race, hostile to me, sails the Tyrrhenian Sea. This gains, described by the adjective, present active participle, portons, bringing Troy. Ilium is the original name for Troy, and that's why the Iliad, which is about a several week period in the 10th year, is called the Iliad. Bringing Troy into Italy, so she sees it as that they are bringing what should be an extinct people and a defunct state and trying to make it relive again in Italy. Bringing Troy into Italy and bringing their conquered, Winco Winkade, Wiki Wiktus, household gods, meaning their culture. She's wanting to stamp this out. And so therefore, she tells the outright reason as to why she wants those ships to be wrecked and why she wants, of course, Aeneas to fail. She gives the command, in cute, strike. From the word cutio cute cusi cusis, that's where we get the word percussion, concussion. Strike, power, force, ablative with the winds, and abrue is your other command. Remember, it's just with an RE taken off to be a singular imperative. Uproot, scatter, I guess uproot is, is maybe the best, or, 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 or destroy the poop decks. The word poopus is indicating the highest deck of a ship. And I used to always think that it was called the poop deck, because that's where birds would poop. It's not. <laughs> it's called a poop deck from the Latin word. And here again we have metonymy, and specifically synecdoche. Because when we say the poop decks, we are indicating the whole as a ship. The same thing again, like I said before, nice wheels means nice car. Not literally, nice car rims. And uproot the poop decks, and they are the submersos. Now that could be really a B, it turns to an M by alliteration. Or not alliteration, uh, uh, uh. Assimilation. Assimilation, thank you for the assistance. And mergeo mergere, remember, it means to sink. And so here, submersos means sunken. And sink, really, of Rue, the sunken ships. Now this is an example of what is called prolepsis. And in prolepsis, it's when you're giving the quality to something before it is naturally done. If you're watching, let's say, a gangster movie, and the head of the gang says, kill that dead man. But you can't kill a dead man. But what you're doing is you're implying that they're already dead. They just don't know it. So, like the walking dead is the person on death row. He's not really dead yet, but he might as well be. And that's what we have in the emphasis that those ships are good as sunken. And that's what she wants him to do. Sink the sunken ships, or literally poop decks. Or, age, drive the scattered ones, the diverse ones, and throw, but with a dis on the front of it, of the yakio, yakare, ikio, ikare, scatter, really, and scatter their bodies, plural and neuter, accusative, on the sea. So she outright tells him what she wants him to do is to obviously create havoc, sink the ships, presumably kill the men. But in these next few lines, and that's what we're going to finish and get to, we see that she doesn't come empty-handed. She does have the authority. She does have the power of the Queen of Gods because of her and her husband Jupiter is why he is the King of the Winds. He's been placed in that position, but she is going to offer him a bribe. And the bribe 
is a bride, a potential wife. She says, there are for me. This is our dative of possession. And you very often see it with a verb to be. Like, for example, I say, there are for me two daughters. It's another way of saying, I have two daughters. So there are for me bis septim. Now, we know that septim means seven, but bis means twice, twice seven. So, in other words, the number 14. If you get medicine and you are to take it, B-I-D, that means you take it twice in a day. Bis in D-A. T-I-D, three times in a day. So there are for me twice seven nymphs. And then here we have what we call the ablative of description, describing those nymphs. Nymphs with something and with a body. But it's a pristanti, literally a standing before, or a preeminent, outstanding body. So in other words, hot bod is what these nymphs apparently have. So there are for me 14 nymphs with hot bod. And so again, we can see what she is emphasizing in this bribe. Of whom, genitive plural, implied the one who is most beautiful. Now, you can be beautiful in many ways. You can have good personality. You can be beautiful in your kindness. But again, what is being emphasized here by Juno is that the physical shape. Beautiful. And this is your ablative of specification. Ablative of description works with a noun to describe that noun. Specification works with an adjective to tell you in what specific way most beautiful. Because like I said, you can be beautiful in many different ways. For this girl, it is most beautiful in her form, with her form. And thus she is then named Deopea, the one of whom, who is most beautiful in their form, that one, Yungam, from Yungo Yungare. I will join together. Yungo, Yungere, Yungsi, Yunctus. That's where we get the word conjugation even. Or conjunction. I will join up that one, Canubio Stabili, in a marriage. And it's a stable marriage. And so we get to the heart of what really a Roman man wants. Even though that this is Aeolus, the god of winds, Virgil is revealing somewhat of Roman culture. And the thing that is most valuable to a Roman man is to have a Roman wife. And why does he want a Roman wife? to make children, especially male children, and we'll see that that's what she brings up. I will join her in a stable marriage, and I will call her proprium. One's own property is kind of the translation of proprium, so the word appropriate. Pardon the interruption. At this time, I need all work-based learning students to report to the cafeteria to meet with Ms. Eccles. At this time, any student that is in work-based learning at any time during the day Please report to the cafeteria to meet with Ms. Eccles at this time. Thank you. All right, so we're almost done. And, as I said, I will call her one's own property. Ut. Now remember, when you see an ut, the first thing you do is look for a subjunctive. And if there is not a subjunctive there, or even if there's no verb there, you'll translate the ut as. But when there is a subjunctive, and indeed we have it, exigat is nothing more than the verb, uh, I'll put it down here, I suppose, ago, Agare to do or to drive. But remember, whenever you put a prefix on a word, very often there will be a vowel change, and that A will very often turn into an I. So, exigo, exigere. You see, however, it's third conjugation. We fear a giant liar. And over here, we fear a giant liar. And so we have these subjunctives, which now tell us that this ut clause is either telling us the result of this action, or it could be telling us the purpose of this action. And that's what we have here. It's a purpose. Why will I join her in a stable marriage? And why will I call her one's own property? A horrible way of looking at a wife, but that's kind of like it was in the ancient world. Ut. Purpose. So that she may drive all her years with you. Drive the years means live. So that she may live all her years with you on behalf of Things having been earned. That's a perfect passive participle from Mario Marere, but it's where we get the word merit or deed. And they are such merits, such things earned, such deeds. So that she may live all her years with you on behalf of such merits, et, and this is the important part, not just to be a companion, so that she may make you a parent, pulcra, prole. And again, your ablative description, describing what kind of parent? With beautiful 
offspring. Proles is the word offspring. It's where we get the word proletariat. Those in a society that are too poor to be counted by what wealth they have in society and just exist because of their offspring. So that she may make you a parent with beautiful offspring. And so we see the bribe as offered up to Aeolus by Juno as being particularly a woman. And the purposes of that woman, of course, is for companionship, to be a wife, and just as, if not more important, to provide beautiful offspring. And then the next lines we find out what his response to her is. Thanks.